Today, the road will take us to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to locate the obscure historical marker where Meriwether Lewis launched the kill boat and officially began the journey to the West. We'll visit the Senator John Hines History Center, an excellent museum, actually. But before that, we actually have to get there. First, we're going to drive a section of the National Road and stop by Fort Necessity National Battlefield. Then, on the following episode, we're going to take the Ohio River Scenic Byway, stopping by Steubenville and historic Fort Steuben, Willing, and beyond as we follow the Ohio River downstream. Just like Meriwether Lewis did in 1803 on his way to meet Clark. In this episode, our series following the Lewis and Clark expedition finally and really begins. I'm riding, 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 riding in my RV, my RV wherever I want to be. Because I'm free in my RV. In 1803, President Thomas Jefferson purchased the Louisiana from the French for $15 million, which pretty much meant everything between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains. That same year, he sent Lewis and Clark on the Corps of Discovery expedition to explore and map the newly acquired territory and find out the route to the Pacific, up the Missouri River, over the Rocky Mountains and down the Columbia River, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. To our knowledge, this was the first time this kind of transcontinental feat was achieved. And for the next few months, it is our intention to follow in their footsteps. Well, I think we're ready. Ready to go. Today we begin the journey to the west. Oh, look at that. There's a squirrel. I hope that the rooftop camera can see it. You know, uh, on the trash, <laughs> getting stuff from the trash. Wildlife, man. <laughs> well, we're, we're, hopefully today we'll be able to stop by Pittsburgh. And that will be the official beginning of the Lewis and Clark trip, if you will. Although we've had so many beginnings now that I don't even know. Enjoy the ride. Off we go. Pennsylvania awaits. Let's go see the scenic view. I want to thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring this episode and share with you the amazing benefits of Magic Spoon cereal. Cereal reinvented, if you will, yet never boring. The adult and the inner child in you will love these tasty flavors that are actually good for you. The main thing here is high protein, low carb and zero sugar, well, except for the honey nut. It's got one gram of sugar, which is nothing really. And it also checks all the other important boxes, being keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free and low carb with no artificial colors or sweeteners. And did I mention they actually taste good? <laughs> Let's give it a taste. Mm. Let me tell you, I've been trying to cut down on carbs and sugar and unhealthy food, and this is a perfect way to start my day. Click the link below to get some Magic Spoon cereal today. You can have a four pack, a six pack, or build your very own variety box and use my code TRAVELING for $5 off. You can choose from the best selling cocoa, my favorite actually, or peanut butter, s'mores, cinnamon roll, fruity frosted blueberry muffin, cookies and cream, and maple waffle. You can also add cereal bars to your variety box. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it is backed with a 100% happiness guarantee, so if you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money no questions asked. So click the link below and use the code TRAVELING for $5 off or go to magicspoon.com slash traveling to save $5 off your order today. Now if you'll excuse me. All right, just had a quick breakfast in there, some cereal. And now I'm gonna check, check out the view, but if I recall correctly, I've been here before and um, 
And this is the, the view that didn't have a view, but I could be wrong. No, that was right. Of course, this whole area is full of battlefields. And apparently the battle that saved Washington happened here. The, ba the Battle of Monocacy. And now where we're going is also another battlefield, so our next stop. The Battle of Monocacy was fought on July 9th, 1864. It was actually the northernmost Confederate victory of the whole Civil War. The delay caused by this battle gave the Union reinforcements sufficient time to get to Washington, D.C. and defend it against the Confederates, thus saving Washington, D.C. We're taking I-70 west, and pretty soon here it is going to start becoming more and more mountainous. And you know I love the mountains. It is such a beautiful drive. We are now arriving in Cumberland, Maryland. Pretty good looking town if you ask me. One of those places which has not been on my radar but now is. It is actually the western terminus of the CNO Canal and there is a one-room cabin at Riverside Park, which was once George Washington's headquarters. And there's even a scenic railway to the Allegheny Mountains. We certainly must return. We are now going to continue on US-40, as it separates from I-68. A very historic road. It was originally the Old National Pike, the first federally funded national highway. And we are now in Pennsylvania. Our first point of interest today actually has nothing to do with the Lewis and Clark journey we intend to retrace. This actually dates back to 1754, to an early battle of the French and Indian War. It was the Battle of Fort Necessity. A viewer recommended I stop here, so here I am. Well, here we are, Fort Necessity, national battlefield. Uh, I'm gonna take a quick break here, I might have lunch, and then we'll continue. We continue towards our final destination for today. On July 13, 1754, a young Colonel George Washington commanding the British colonial forces had to surrender here to the French and the Indians. On the morning of July 3, 1754, 22-year-old George Washington marched his troops out of their camp to await the advancing French and Indians. This is the People's Highway, and they crowd it from rim to edge. Yeah, you learn something new every day, and today I learned about the National Road, which I suppose it is uh, US 40 uh, in this part. And, um, you know, in the early 1800s, uh, it was the, the site of great migration to the West. So, um, not something not for this trip, but something for the future, uh, for sure. Okay, let's do the trail to the fort, and we may do the trail to the f to the tavern as well. And uh, you are here. By the way, Fort Necessity here was a viewer's suggestion. And as you guys know, a lot of you are the source of my research and how I find out about different about different places. And that was one of the biggest problems with this fort, uh, all these trees all around it. Uh, so, um, you know, the enemies could take over behind the trees and they were just more or less at the, at the range of, of, the, of the weaponry of the time. So, um, 
yeah, wasn't very effective as a fort. This is of course a reconstruction. The French burned the fort to the ground after the battle, and the fort's location had one major flaw, being in this clearing surrounded by forest. This was a time when three different cultures would collide here, the British, the French, and the Native Americans. Washington was in charge of building a road to French-occupied present-day Pittsburgh, and he never intended to fight here. This was supposed to be just a supply storage facility. Had he known that he may have to fight, he probably would have cleared the woods a little more, beyond the range of the muskets at the time. That's where the name Necessity comes from. He had to fight here out of necessity, because the French were coming after him and his men. Here's the cabin where they would store the perishable supplies like gunpowder, rum, cornmeal, flour, just to keep them from the elements. Yeah, definitely not a whole lot of protection in there, but um, I'm sure when the, when the fight started, you know, they have this trench all around it. Oh, you see, there's a small cannon there. That's where you would hide from the enemy. All right, all right, all right let's go to that tavern. You think they'll have IPAs? It's early, maybe they're not open yet. It's not even open. We are here now, and there is a network of trails that go all the way, you know, in, inside the forest that we're not gonna do today. If we ever return, we'll do it sometime. But right now, I'm thinking the tavern. I was gonna come with Minitini to the tavern, but let's face it, I have an extra hour and a half or so of driving today. And, um, and you know, walking a little bit, you know, it's good for the circulation and whatnot. So I'm just gonna walk it. I think you have to go up a hill. Well, I'm glad I came this way because there's another nice view of the fort from here. The tavern was built in 1830 along the National Road. It was a stopping place for stagecoaches and their travelers. So instead of a tavern in the modern sense, it was more like a hostel or bed and breakfast, I guess. So mm -mm, I don't think we're gonna find any IPAs here. Nowadays, it is more like a museum with guided tours. That's from Baltimore. Almost to St. Louis. Huh? This would have been the bar room, where men would socialize and maybe have a drink or two and share stories from the road. This would have been the communal dining room. Let's go upstairs to see the bedrooms, which were set up dormitory style, with men in one room, women in another. By the way, the tavern went out of business in 1856 because of new technology. Railroads! I mean, that's what nowadays we call an RV, right? <laughs> Can you imagine now one of the next trips is gonna have to be this road all the way from Baltimore? to almost St. Louis, so um, we'll be back. <laughs> okay, Robert, focus. Today we're going to Pittsburgh, so let's get going. By the way, very cool, very cool. Uh, they have uh, three volunteers in there, you know, dressed uh, in, in period clothing and uh, they explain everything to you and it's very nice the gentleman spoke spanish so he was uh, speaking to me in spanish and um, i mean due to my time constraints today since this was not part of the plan i would have preferred more self-guided quick tour but it was uh, it was very interesting and i learned uh, things that i didn't know so now let's take this trail 
I'm just gonna have some probably hummus and pita chips and, uh, and continue. They have a very nice diorama here at the visitor center so we can have a better idea about what happened here. By the way, there are many other historical sites along this road, like Braddock's grave here on the right, which memorializes the final resting place of British Major General Edward Braddock. But we must focus on the task at hand, and that is getting to Pittsburgh. We're actually going to be staying at Tomlinson Run State Park. It is about an hour west, in West Virginia actually, but a good base to explore that whole area of the Ohio River Scenic Byway. I find it funny how some states are more dramatic than others when it comes to dangerous roads, or in this case, a three mile steep downhill grade descending onto Uniontown. Even though they don't specify grade percentage or anything like that. In other states, it is like 7% for seven miles. Enjoy the ride. We hope you know how to drive. Brownsville here is also a pretty good looking town. And now we're about to cross the Monongahela River. The Monongahela joins the Allegheny at Point Park in Pittsburgh to form the Ohio River, which is the river we're going to be following here real soon. As we drive by Centerville and Ritchieville, it almost feels like every other house is having a yard sale. It must be a thing this time of the year. Billsville here, also a very pretty town. And that is the joy of taking the US highways instead of the interstate. You actually get to see these kinds of things along the way. And more yard sales. Now arriving at Scenery Hill, and here we actually have a traffic jam. I wonder if it is some kind of special event, or something that happens every Sunday in spring? This is crazy, this town is really happening. If I had a smaller rig, I would definitely stop and see what it is all about, but besides that, we do have to make it to the Pittsburgh area at some point today. We are in West Virginia, a couple of hours and several rain showers later. Now the GPS has taken us on this narrow, windy road that eventually will take us to the campground. This, by the way, was the only campground that had vacancy, and perhaps too much vacancy. This is almost empty. Seems to be a beautiful campground. Yeah. I kind of don't like being back here all by myself, but... In any case, we're gonna have to improvise a new plan, because with this weather, I'm like, mm-mm. It's only electric doesn't seem to be the most level side, so let's, let's see what we do. Well, isn't this nice? Everything is wet, but otherwise it is a beautiful campground. Let me show you. And I've made a decision. We're not, we're not going to Pittsburgh today. Uh, we're gonna go tomorrow. I decided when I got here on a whim to ask for an extra night. So we're gonna stay two nights here. And, uh, and then tomorrow, 
we'll day trip around uh, as, as much as we can, you know, and uh, go as far as, uh, as far west down the Ohio uh, as possible, uh, as, as feasible, let's say, it's maybe two hours uh, away at the, at the farthest point, so. Uh, that's the plan. Pittsburgh, then we're gonna see the world's largest teapot, uh, Steubenville, and Willing, and uh, then we'll see. But check, check out this, but it's not the most level site, it's only electric. I've got plenty of water, and uh, holding tanks are empty, so we're good. But it's a very large site, very private here. Site number 16. Make a note. Look at that have like a big forest and a, and a ravine. Well, good morning. We're going to Pittsburgh, which would be the launching point of uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition. We're gonna try to find the exact point where they launched the kill boat. And uh, of course my Lewis and Clark t-shirt is in the dirty laundry. So <laughs> I thought this would be the, the second best choice. Uh, we've got about an hour drive to the city of Bridges and then we'll, you know, follow the Ohio River. We have a neighbor here, another Micro Mini, a regular 2108DS actually. There's the TB, 2108 TB is the twin bed version. It appears he arrived late last night. So he's setting up right now, which is good. You know, it's uh, I feel more comfortable not being the only person on this loop, actually. coolest thing about arriving to Pittsburgh. You take the tunnel, and as you come out, the big reveal. Pittsburgh is one of the coolest cities, let me tell you. I love it, especially the downtown triangle framed by the confluence of the Allegheny and the Monongahela. And today, we're not really gonna see all that much. We were here back in 2021 and saw many more of the highlights. Today, we're on a mission. And coincidentally, it was somewhere around here on the left that Meriwether Lewis launched that kill boat back in 1803. And now, we're going to look for that very spot. But first, let's find parking. How about some coffee? That was a good espresso. Although, in reality, I only had to go to the bathroom. You know, so it felt right to, to buy something. <laughs> now let's go find that, uh, that historical marker. And then that's the, the history museum, which we might visit afterwards. By the way, I parked at this huge parking lot here. It's called the Riverfront Landing. And let me tell you something about the temperature. I don't know if I can walk all the way over there. We'll figure it out. By Florida standards, this is what I would consider consider a little chilly. Very it is. I wonder if I can cross to that side. Yes, that would be the very inconspicuous marker. All right, now we are on the correct side of the street. The car is right there. I almost went back to get my hoodie, but I mean, it's not that cold. It's 59 degrees, 59. It feels a little colder for some reason. Maybe because it's cloudy. But the sign is right there. I mean, I parked like a hundred yards from the sign. <laughs> that was perfect. I can't believe this is the only marker in the whole city of Pittsburgh. Well, this is it. That's the historical marker right there. And apparently just 100 yards downstream is where they launched that famous killboat. And that's uh, 
That's where we're gonna go now. Well, yes, in all likelihood, this would have been the spot where the expedition began. So it begins for us as well. These three yellow bridges are called the Three Sisters because of being so similar in design. I really think that the city of Pittsburgh should have like like a replica of the boat here. You know, let's uh, revive this uh, this piece of American history. August 31st, 1803. It happened right here. Let's walk across on this walkway under the convention center. Let me tell you, Pittsburgh is a beautiful city. I'm surprised it doesn't get more tourism. I mean, look at that skyline, you know, everywhere you look. It's like... I think as far as cities go, Pittsburgh gets way underestimated. It's got great architecture, great character, its own religion called the Steelers, and even its own dialect, colloquially known as Pittsburghese. Let's go into the museum. Here we have an old streetcar. And it became home to the Hornets, Pittsburgh's ice hockey team. The garden also hosted other skating events, such as the Ice Follies. Here's a stainless steel car. One of six designed by Allegheny Steel to prove the durability of the material. This is one of those museums that, I'm gonna warn you beforehand, we're going to rush it a little bit. By the way, check out this late 19th century Heinz Hitch. One of the main reasons we are here is because there is a Lewis and Clark exhibit, which is really more like a footnote compared to what we'll encounter later along the route. This is the Bantam reconnaissance car from 1941, arguably the world's oldest jeep. This is one of those museums where you could spend the whole day. There is so much to see, like there's almost a whole floor dedicated to an exhibit called Clash of Empires, the British, French and Indian War. Here's George Washington in 1954, probably after the Fort Necessity surrender. Very realistic, all these wax sculptures. I also love seeing these detailed dioramas of the different battles. There's also a World War II exhibit. Here we go, here's our Lewis and Clark section, more about the core of rediscovery expedition done in 2003, with a grizzly welcoming us. Here's a map of Pittsburgh at the time of the original expedition. That's what the town would have looked like. An original letter from Jefferson to Lewis, before the expedition. Hmm, Fort Fayette. That is more or less the location of the present-day convention center. That's a very nice illustration of the keel boat, 
as they are loading it up, ready for departure, six weeks behind schedule. That's the route we intend to take, more or less. Here's an 1802 map of North America. As you can see, most of the West is blank. The unknown Lewis and Clark were about to begin mapping, cataloging, and discovering. Of course, the whole exhibition is more about the rediscovery trip made in 2003 by Dan and Art Rooney. Standing at the forks of the Ohio River, the very head of navigation for the Mississippi and beyond. The museum also highlights all the things that were discovered, invented, or created, or started, founded in Pittsburgh, like for example, Mr. Rogers. Also to be totally accurate, the series originally debuted in Canada, based on an earlier program that originally aired on WQED here in Pittsburgh. Of course, there would have to be a large exhibit about the H. J. Hines Company, which was also founded in Pittsburgh, its products and its history. There is also a Slavery to Freedom exhibition, with artifacts and displays portraying the dire conditions enslaved men and women had to endure en route to the Americas. The crops they were forced to cultivate Finally, the fight for freedom. Oh wait, there's another section here with more Lewis and Clark uh, displays and artifacts. But first, whiskey! I knew there had to be more, although this particular exhibit is not listed as a separate item on the museum guide. Here's Meriwether Lewis writing on his journal. Ooh, an original print edition of the journal, The Voyages and Travels of the Core of Discovery. I've been reading a book called Undaunted Courage that uses the journal and many other sources as reference. Hmm, boat building tools of the 19th century. Interesting. Hmm. 
Here's an old transmitter belonging to KDKA, the world's first commercial radio station, which began broadcasting in 1920. There is so much to see here. I had not realized how many things had been pioneered or invented here in Pittsburgh, or it being home to so many important companies like the Westinghouse Electric Corporation. I don't know how I thought I could see this museum in just a couple of hours. This really deserves a whole day, but I think we've seen the highlights. Oh, by the way, there is an extensive separate sports museum, the Western Pennsylvania Sports Museum. I'm not surprised, this being the sports town that it is. As I mentioned earlier, I have heard the Steelers football team are practically a religion in this town. how huge this, uh, this museum is. Huge museum. I was only gonna do like the Lewis and Clark, uh, uh, you know, section. But first of all, it was a very small section. And it's such a great museum, you know, encompassing, you know, I had forgotten, you know, when I studied, uh, radio broadcasting I, I learned about kdka uh, their first radio the first commercial radio station i just didn't know it was from here and many other things uh, let's get the car and and follow the ohio river going west on the next episode we begin following the meriwether lewis journey down the ohio on his way to meet up with clark at the falls of the ohio until then thank you so much for watching and see you on the road. I'm riding, riding in my arms.